attention to the state of the nation with focus on ending terror in the northeast. Now joining us on the program are a pair of very intellectual gentlemen. Dr. Paul Bemshima is on the studio. Doctor, good morning to you. Good morning. And we also have Barrister Elias Ofo as well in the studio as well. Barrister, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, let's quickly set the ball rolling, uh, Barrister. There is, um, has, there's been an age-long uh, problem in the northeastern part of the country. I believe it's been um, about 15 years since the first Boko Haram attack occurred in Borno State back in 2009. 15 years down the line, we are still seeing pockets of attacks in, in rural communities in Borno State, in Adabar State, and Yobe State as well. What, what is your reaction to, to this uh, menace that has bedeviled that region for you know, more than a decade? Well, it's quite disheartening. Everybody knows that. Nigeria has grappled with it for a long time. Like I've always uh, said, um, for the underworld, in the terrorist world, the Lake Chad Basin has been very prolific to them. And because um, similar groups in different parts of the, of the world have been uh, decapitated. For instance, you know that Daesh is disappearing. Their potency have been whittled down by forces over there. The government um, organized um, counter-terror activities have actually um, dealt a devastating blow yes. to, to, to a very great extent. So, um, in order to uh, remain relevant, the, 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 the um, splinter cells are regrouping, uh, especially in a place they could uh, find a suitable subtree to operate. And the lecture basin, I saw how the Sahel is um, part of the places. Yes. They are coming to still uh, uh, remain uh, relevant. And uh, just like I know that, I'd always say it's not post conflict anyway. Uh, when you talk of uh, post-conflict, this post-conflict, that. It's just that we can't just fold our hands. We keep on um, bringing up policies that will um, keep on making people uh, lives and uh, property um, uh, to remain. And that is just what it is. So, but it's not ending because once in a while, or if probably they're going to hibernation, you see them coming back again, um, suicide bombing and all sorts of activities pushing, you know, bringing up mayhem and all that. So it's it's so disheartening. Uh, that's the realities we're found in the present time. Well, so. cr crossing over to you, uh, Dr. Ben Shiba, uh, many people uh, would say that the Boko Haram crisis in the Northeast was firstly, um, you know, orchestrated by religious sentiments. Then it uh, became politically motivated. But now, 15 years down the line, why do you think the Nigerian state has not successfully squashed in complete Complete totality, the insurgency in that region. Yeah, I think um, you're right when you say religious sentiments uh, induced it. Uh, but I think substantially we need to look at the socioeconomic conditions that drive conflicts and insurgency. And it's not only in the northeast; all over the country. Uh, if you ask yourself what the push and pull factors are to what extent uh, is unemployment um, going high, to what extent are people hungry, to what extent are we paying attention to the needs of citizens, especially youths. Um, you will come to the realization that uh, you know the factors that drive conflicts and insurgency and terrorism, whatever form it takes in the Northeast and all over the country, uh, there are a myriad of factors. And so we need to pay attention to all of that, but definitely religious sentiments and ideology are really very strong. Uh, you can win the battle, but it's usually difficult to win the war. Uh, in the Northeast, I think we have won several battles. Um, the military has taken over the Sambisa forest, yes. uh, Camp Zero particularly a couple of times. Okay. Uh, we have had situations where people are returning. Uh, back to their communities, and uh, some of them are stable, some of them are yet being attacked again. So, um, like my colleague here mentioned, it's uh, a kind of situation that is still unstable. Uh, peace hasn't fully returned, but I think there's quite a lot of efforts in dealing with them uh, through kinetic and non-kinetic means. Uh, the Northeast has done quite well in terms of uh, the non-kinetic means. Uh, you realize that after the, the death of Shekau, there was mass exit uh, from, from, from the camps. Yes. Uh, I think at the last count, it's over 80,000 people who have left the camps. 
uh, which is some kind of uh, progress uh, that we are achieving. But I think to finally begin to resolve the issue, we have to consistently um, you know, acquire more pockets of peace. So there's this idea of pockets of peace and pockets of stability. So to what extent are we recovering territories that hitherto have been under attack from the insurgent groups? Uh, you know, for counterinsurgency operations, that's actually the kind of model to adopt. Well, you rightly pointed out that um, a lot of victories have been won in that region with uh, regard to the fight against the insurgency. Uh, now, I, I believe a lot of Nigerians are sentimental with regards to uh, the rehabilitation of ex Boko Haram members who were labeled repentant and then reintegrated back into the into their communities we have seen reports in recent times where these repentant boko haram members you know ventured out again and started attacking their communities or even attacking their immediate family members uh, are we progressing in the fights or, or are these decisions all retrogressive yeah um i think so many countries even colombia you know so many countries who have grappled with terrorism it takes quite a while Yes. You know, to deal with it because the factors driving it are usually quite much. Um, but to the question you asked uh, about, um, you know, repentant terrorists or defectors, or as we call them in uh, in Gombe, the Operation Safe Corridor, they are called clients. Clients. Um, we need to understand very clearly the categorization of these groups. So when we hear about you know, rehabilitation programs for groups like repentance, terrorists, as we call them. There are different categories, and those categories, it's only when you understand them that you would know that it's actually the right thing to do to rehabilitate. Um, several attacks have happened. There are people who have been forcefully conscripted. Yes. And so they are not hardcore terrorists because they were compelled to join. To join. There are also groups that are associated. There are women who have been held hostage as bushwives, as sex slaves, sorry to use that word. And like in the case nice, of the Chibo girls that were that were abducted. The girls that were abducted. These categories of groups, would you call them hardcore terrorists? These are groups we refer to as associated groups. Aside from these groups, we have those who are hardcore terrorists, diehard terrorists. Those ones, uh, when they are captured at the front lines, they go through the judicial system. P permit me to quickly chip in. How do you differentiate, uh, well, apart from the women yeah. that you rightly pointed out are being used as sex slaves, how do you distinguish between the hardcore terrorists and innocent um, community dwellers that were attacked and recruited to join the, the, the Boko Haram insurgents? How do you differentiate when you interface with them? Yeah, so there's a, there's a way that is done. Um, it's called risk categorization. So you look at uh, the categorization in terms of the extent of risk that each of these categories pose to society. And uh, in many cases, uh, for associated groups, yes, if they are met at the front line, so let me go a bit technical. Uh, for associated groups, if you capture them at the front lines, usually what happens, groups that surrender at the front line, are sometimes categorized as eligible for profiling. So they go through a detailed process where they are being questioned, they are being asked, you know, the security services, uh, they are being asked where they come from, what role they played, and all that. There are technical checklists that are used to yes. ask them a couple of questions. Psychologists, security services, intelligence, you know, they, they ask them a couple of questions and then they are categorized based on their involvement in the front. But the ones that are hardcore terrorists, frankly, I've worked in contexts where I have engaged directly, not in Nigeria. Uh, Somalia, for example, I've worked there a couple of years. If you meet them, they never repent. They tell you, oh, if, uh, why did you capture, I mean, if I were the one who captured you, I'll kill you. So the ideology is usually very strong in them. They are unrepentant. Even when you're questioning them, some of them refuse to talk. So there are different ways for which experts that are, you know, involved in these profiling processes get to now categorize. The other bit is what crimes against humanity have they committed. There are wider level assessments that are conducted. If people have been identified to have committed crimes against humanity, maybe using children as shields, 
urine attacks or forcefully conscripted people, then they go through the judicial process. So there are two tracks in the Northeast, basically. The hardcore ones go through the judicial process. Those groups that are associated and considered low risk are the only ones who are eligible for rehabilitation. And those ones actually need sympathy from the society because they never joined on their own accord. They were conscripted. Well, l let me come back to you now, Barry Stelfer. Um Apart from the insurgency in the Northeast, we have seen situations like the farmer herder clashes that have in recent years turned very violent in different regions of the country. We have seen in the, in the northwestern part of the country uh, the banditry and kidnapping that has rocked that region. And in the southeastern parts of the country, we have also experienced the uh, unknown gunmen menace that has rocked that area. If you recall, in 2009, the Boko Haram insurgency also started off as a baby crisis in Borno State and then escalated into one of the deadliest um, situations that we've ever experienced as a country. How can we stem down the, you know, issues rising in different parts of Nigeria that at first seem like baby crisis but then eventually turn into something more violent? Anyway, um, it's still part of the answer that Dr. Paul gave. Um, um, you have to better the loss of the people, create employment, as in bring up policies that would uh, dissuade the regroup regrouping and the recruitment of uh, the youths into yes. some of these uh, activities. That is um, a very good starting point and um, a not non kinetic at that. So bring up things that will engage uh, the youths especially because these are the kind of group, particular group, the society demographic, demographic group yes. that um, readily join um, some of these nefarious activities. <coughs> and again, address some issues uh, that um, are seemingly political, like marginalization and all that. Um, for instance, in Nigeria, some uh, regions are crying of marginalization and all that. So it's, it's, it's worth looking into. It's, I don't want to go in depth. Uh, in the last session, we talked about um, releasing some political prisoners and all that. It is yes. part of the bargain on the table. It is part of the agitations. From, uh, even though it might not be too loud, uh, but that is a way to probably come in to make an explicit statement that, yes, we are very serious in trying to balance the equation, the political equation in the country. So these are some of the issues that are on the table that they shouldn't um, uh, keep um, ignoring. Then the kinetic aspect of it is not um, out of the place. Um, um, the security, of course, you know, the state police and all that, the bill has been passed into law. That's a step ahead, like I said in the previous session. And um, things like that, they, they need to equip the police. Equip the police. It shouldn't be the military. The military do not understand the dynamics in, um, in um, quelling uprising, especially among the civilians. The police is trained most of the time to do that. So if you equip the police and all that parametric... Yeah, outfits, like NSCDC in, yes. in this situation. Yes, yes. Equip them and then give them the necessary training. Because when you look at it um, in Nigeria, you find that um, most things are centered on the military. Of course, you don't blame the country. The vestiges of uh, military rule, um, the civil war and all that are translated. For. But the question is, how long are we going to remain here? The police should be equipped to work. In terms of intelligence gathering, in terms of so many other things, um, that will be a very terrible tool in um, in, um, in, the, in, the, in the security um, uh, security architecture in the country. So, so it's not just like um, continuing putting the uh, square peg in the round hole or the round hole in the square peg and allowing it to work. It cannot work. So, that is just it. The non-kinetic look at the welfare of the people, dissuade things that would make it interesting for youth to be recruited into various uh, organization. Then, up the kinetic aspect, the equipped with security aspect, especially those that are appropriately the considered authority that are responsible um, for for um, 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 security works in the, in the in the in the fight against uh, crime and all that. So that's basically it. Now, gentlemen, I must appreciate the background we have established for anyone following the conversation on the two parts in our hope to rebuild peace in the northeast, particularly. Dr. Ben Shima, I'll come back to you. It's interesting to listen to the conceptualization of pockets of terror and pockets of peace. Now, more so with the in-depth work that is done by organizations like yours and other stakeholders in the fight for peace in Nigeria. One of the challenges that goes into the conversation is 
how long the Nigerian state has continued to grapple with these issues and the projections into when we can confidently say with setting a target that comes say 2030 or 2063 the Nigerian state would have emboldened itself to have key frameworks in line to help checkmate a recurrence of these issues which seem to be perennial in the Nigerian perspective so is there a time frame or how much work is international let Nigerian doing to give Nigerians hope of an end to this terror we continue to see in the country yeah thanks very much international alert is doing its best to a core peace building organization and we've convened decision makers a couple of times uh, to put some of these issues on the table there's a general realization that the factors that drive violence and terrorism in nigeria seem to be similar it's it's not so different across the country um, but we're talking about the Northeast and timelines for when uh, some of these uh, you know, problems end, is that it's difficult to set a timeline. I think the timeline we need to set is an in-depth understanding of the factors driving the violence or the insurgency or banditry, the factors driving it, and then a clear plan for how the state aims to address them would be the basis for which we reduce radicalization. Um, in areas where escalation has already happened, uh, to what extent are we engaging with the groups? You know, why do people choose to fight? You know, there is this very interesting publication a friend of mine wrote, why they choose to fight. So fighting is a choice, but what makes people choose to fight? And I think the basic idea is that communities don't want to be at war with each other because the consequences of war are actually unpleasant. People die, people lose their property, people suffer trauma, uh, people leave in IDP camps, you know, very difficult conditions. And so why do these things definitely happen? These are some of the very deep questions that decision makers need to ask themselves. I think when you apply a securitized approach, yes. you will go in leaps and bounds, you keep going round and round without addressing the issues. Because what that means is you are addressing the symptoms and not the cause. Now, talking about addressing issues, remember back in April, President Bola Metinibu here in the nation's capital hosted the counterterrorism summit. And in his uh, speech, which we took some time analyzing the last time you were here, he mentioned issues on poverty and social injustice as some of the key factors that continue to be deviled the Northeast. Now, we're seeing much of it also associated with illegal mining in some of these communities. It's not that we don't have a ministry for uh, solid minerals saddled with legal requirements to be able to checkmate this so-called ungoverned spaces. But is it a lack of political will or is it that the concerted effort needs a redoubling? Or what are some of the ways we can tackle this poverty and social injustice from communities where they are most plagued with these issues as aforementioned? Yeah, so tackling uh, the issues from a bottom-up approach uh, I will just share a kind of model that we apply as International Alert. As International Alert, we have uh, a sort of model we refer to as a community justice and stability plans. What that simply means is understanding the key priorities that divided communities or communities affected by conflict have come together to, to free. So you put that in a kind of plan. This is a kind of micro, locally led plan. These can actually feed into the state plan or the state development plan and even at the national level. So when you merge all of these priorities from bottom to the top, it gives you a clear sense of some of the needs that people face in these areas by needs implying some of the factors driving radicalization and recruitment into violence, as Barista Elias had mentioned earlier on. Um, so we need to look at these issues um, carefully. And then, uh, most importantly, most of these summits are held, but to what extent are the resolutions uh, implemented? I think implementing it will begin from a place of understanding the factors that drive violence, and then being very clear as to what policies are made to address them. Um, where people are aggrieved, what are the grievances? Uh, however unreasonable what they say is, you need to try to take them to the negotiation table. 
go and understand what these issues are. You, you, you keep calling for, for the dialogue, negotiations, you know, coming to a round table to have a discussion. Uh, I believe that uh, different people have diverse opinions when it, when, when it comes to negotiating with terrorists or bandits. Like in the case of, uh, you know, the Islamic cleric uh, Sheikh uh, Gumi who had, who was interfacing with bandits on behalf of the government. People were split into two. Some were for, you know, the negotiation, while the majority, a large majority of people were kicking against it, saying that on no account should the government negotiate with bandits on issues of, of um, national security. What is your own stand in this situation? Okay, I think it's context specific. Okay. You need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. In the Northwest, for example, there have been attempts for at negotiation, which didn't quite work. Katina tried most, most of them ended very terribly. Zanfara tried it. But I would say that we need to really evaluate how we're doing these things. Um, do we grant unconditional amnesty to groups? You know, you need to profile these groups before you identify the ones that are eligible for negotiation. Um, there are those that are sheer criminals who are not ready and they use this shifting strategy. You negotiate with them in Sokoto, they move to Zamfara. You negotiate with them in Zamfara, they move to Katina. When the heat is really hot in certain areas, they move. So this shifting strategy, what that implies is that you can negotiate with them and then, you know, it doesn't quite work. But also, to what extent are we keeping our terms of the negotiation? That's also a big question. So rather than say it has failed, um, I would say that we need to review how we are doing it. These are very technical processes that require some level of expertise. These are political solutions that require real deep technical analysis, you know, to come to a place where we do it. It's not just things that anybody can sit on the table and do. You need to be trained to do that. Um, now, yeah. now, much like Dr. Ben Shima has said, it, it requires a high level approach. A high level approach was held back in April I'm very sure a lot of resolutions were brought to the table. But now, the president also highlighted the ever-evolving nature of terrorism financing, much like Dr. Ben Shima has highlighted here. It's now being looked at from a regional approach or into countries we share borders with, and the fact that some of these bandits, insurgents, are said to be imported from other countries. How can the sub-region, especially at a time when we're seeing more states pulling out to form the Sahel Union, reconcert its efforts to tackling terrorism and by broad implications yielding the results we desire in Nigeria. Yeah, um, actually, um, terrorism financing is a, is a very big issue. In fact, it is one of the major problems um, hampering robust counter-terror efforts that um, have um, started. Yes, in different parts of the world, actually. And Nigerian situation is quite bizarre. Bizarre because uh, a lot of statements have been made, and nothing followed it. And um, even people were mentioned, other countries came up to start saying, we're going to start mentioning people that fund terrorism in your country, and nothing, it didn't see the light of the day. Everything ended up in sophistry and all that. So it's just international cooperation, it's, it's uh, one thing that would um, help tackle this. And of course, if you check the Eurozone, uh, um, European Union is one, con one continent, um, one, one regional uh, uh, organization that um, have brought up the like Europe police and the rest of them, this is the way they are doing it. International borders are already compartmentalized. There's a robust um, security uh, mechanism to check movement of monies and all that. It's not just about having a single currency. Uh, there's um, there's um, a technology have come in. Um, to check how monies move and all that. And of course, in some other climes, uh, your, your, your source of income and how it moves, it's, it's actually uh, monitored. I, I was in Europe, I was a student in Europe, and um, I had an issue, that was the month my mom had, had um, a stroke. So I, I got charity um, to help my academics and all that. And um, little did I know that my account was being monitored. I closed my account in Nigeria and told my friend to transfer the money to me. I got an email to explain what's happening to the money. I now went to my academic advisor I said, I didn't know that um, the charity I got was actually something in the public domain. I thought it was a private thing. And I had to respond appropriately. And even 
the, the, the post ticket, the post receipt that I used to send my ATM, because that's what I did. I sent my ATM by post to a friend in Nigeria to see how he could pull out that money by euro and then how to transfer that to me. So that's exactly what happened. So if we have we have the BVN, we have some other things. Mm -hmm. Yes, the name and all that. But you find out that these things are not even uh, been okay. You can imagine the data. I don't know. Do, do I call it wiretapping or something? The data invasion that Nigerians complain about. They're selling the data and all that. These are big issues that you don't get to hear about in, 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 in due time. Things happen in Nigeria and you begin to wonder how is it followed up? It died a natural death. Who sold the data of Nigerians? Who did that? We have the NIMSI, we have this other agency that, that managed data. Has anyone come back to tell Nigerians, give a robust explanation as to this is what happened? It never happened. You didn't hear anything about it again. At least selected an ammunition. Nobody's asking a question. Our data were sold to uh, people. Fish, that, online fishing sites. Online fishing sites. Now, Dr. Benjamin, listening to Barrister Elias for he's raised certain concerns that most often at times die natural deaths. I remember just yesterday, Interpol as well issued an alert to Nigeria and other African countries about humongous amounts of hundreds of billions that are being laundered from these African countries, which are most likely related to financing of terrorism as well, which has gone largely untraced. The president cited that uh, apart from the centers we have in Addis Ababa's in Algiers and Abuja, there's more reasons to have a regional structure for counter-terrorism that has a concerted coordination, much like he said his account was tracked, to track some of these financiers of terrorism. Care to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's the way to go. We need to strengthen both our internal mechanisms and also how we are talking to our neighbors. That's international cooperation. Terrorist financing has become a big issue. And um, we've heard uh, a couple of times something like that's going on here. And uh, we haven't quite heard anyone brought to book. Um, aside from money coming from without, there's also that bit you mentioned around mining. Yes. How people use certain commodities internally to feed into the world economy. In the Northeast, for example, fish in Baga was a big issue. How some of these commodities are captured by criminal groups and used to fund uh, terrorist activities. You know, we need to look at the internal uh, war economies uh, very carefully and, you know, see how that can be mitigated. In the Northwest, for example, we're beginning to hear mine, you know, mining of gold playing a very critical role. Uh, artisanal mining, but then to what end, to what purpose? Uh, there are different patterns uh, how this is happening. So when you talk about the blood gold, for example, in the Northwest, as it's happened with diamond in Sierra Leone, you find communities that have developed artisanal type Minus. experience, you know, of doing these things. And then under duress or under force, you know, they are compelled to mine this gold and then you actually don't know where that's, you know, what the proceeds are going to. The proceeds are going to. So, but I think the Ministry of Solid Minerals need to pay, pay, look at these issues very closely in terms of uh, profiling, registering some of these groups and these cooperatives you know, flagging these different hotspots, working very closely with security agencies to understand what's going on in those areas, uh, whether covert or overt. We need to understand what's happening, you know, to some of these minerals that terrorist groups. At some point, it was cows, for example. Cattle rustling, you know, um, was a kind of terrorist financing in the Northwest. Uh, and we know how the movements happened. Yeah. They rustle the cattle and take it to the south or to Lagos you know, to certain black markets. And how that now becomes weapons and guns and bullets, it's, it's another question. If we have a very good tracking system and our intelligence is as effective as, you know, following from the point of theft to the point of sale and where that is feeding into, I think we would, we would, we would begin to make a bit of progress in this area. Well, Barrister, well, let's um, have a little bit on the issue of accountability in the system. Um, just over a, lit a week ago, uh, the uh, kidnapping and banditry kingpin, Bello Turji, made a video 
accusing the current Minister of State for Defense, Bello Matawali, of being a major financier of terrorism in the country. Now, these are very, very heavy allegations coming from someone like Turji, who in the first place shouldn't even be alive up until now, considering the havoc he has wrecked in the Northwest. In the past, we have also seen Boko Haram come out to accuse two former Borno State governors of financing terrorism in that region. Allegations are always made, yet we don't see any form of action being taken, you know, on the part of the government to ensure that investigations are made into some of these statements. Uh, you know, they, they, they say there is no smoke without fire. Don't you think so? You know what? There is no smoke without fire. There could still be smoke without fire, actually. Um, you have just said it all. It, it just calls for investigation. It just calls for conscious investigation into the allegations and all that. I said also sweeping it below the carpet because the man that is making allegation is um, doesn't have a clean hand. As yes. I say, he who goes to equity must come with clean hands. But in serious security situation, um, just like uh, Dr. Paul had always said, things should be context specific. You check out the context, evaluate it. And I'm sure security agencies, maybe the NIA and the concerned bodies probably must have weighed that allegation probably Maybe found or didn't find merit in it, um, but there it shouldn't be something to be waved off. Everything should, especially in the current situation of Nigeria, you, 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 nothing is insignificant actually. Again, I keep talking about communication, accountability in governance, especially in the security sector. Nigerians are old a lot. We need to know what is going on in terms of certain critical situation. You should tell people what is happening. In senior crimes, in the United States, for instance, you see policemen wearing body cams. That's part of accountability. It is not just because of their boss that would ask them what happened during operation. It's for the people to see. Evidence. At the end of the day, you see them play the video to the public domain. The, the, this the, is what the, is the, the only paramilitary um, uh, force that we see wearing body cams today is, is just the FRC. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't. The the, I, the, the Federal Road Safety Corps where body comes on good. operations on, on the, on the and, and uh, roads. Not, not even all of them. Anyway, it some of them. them. Actually, some of them. But this, I'm talking about accountability in policies, accountability in policy implementation and all that. Especially in critical sector like security. We should know, like you mentioned, Belotoriji and all that, the allegations and all that. So, what happened at the end of the day? When Nigerians told that this is the extent we looked at this and we found no merit in this allegation and all that, it sounds so insignificant, but it shouldn't be. Because it's a critical situation. And I keep saying it, confidentiality is another part of, um, how do I put it, my article on, um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a state communication is a paradigm shift in counter-terror strategy. There should be communication. We should have confidence in the security architecture, security apparatus. Intelligence gathering. Public domain. It will even dissuade. Um, um, it will even dissuade alliance, sympathy, adherence, and all that. All ultra recruitment into into into, into some of these nefarious organizations, for this uh, 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 terrorist, uh, terrorist uh, yes. organizations and all that. So when people have confidence, okay. For instance, in the not in some time, I learned Boko Haram even came in to preach to the people, had time to rapport with them, had time to discuss and preach their ideology, it shouldn't be. There's a duty on the part of the state, part of the government, to bring up strategy to dissuade all this, not just overt act, but certain, is this Sun Tzu that said they, 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 to fight the enemy, to, to win the enemy without fighting the Akmel scale? Psychological aspect of it, communication is quite key. Whatever happened with allegation made by Bello to Regina. Nigerians deserve to know. Was it investigated? Okay, we didn't find merit in it. We should know. This is just a tip of the iceberg. Other similar situations, other similar situations that Nigerians don't care to know about what happened thereafter, they, they, are, they, are, quite, they are quite much. Now, we have a little less than 10 minutes, and let's factor in some of the remarkable efforts in enhancing the country's counterterrorism capabilities. We're a country governed by law. On the one hand, the president has talked about the enactment of the Terrorism Prevention and Prohibition Act and also the establishment of the National Terrorism Counter Center. How important are both of these in terms of our cost to fighting terrorism? Yeah, those are really very important uh, from a policy and institutional standpoint. Uh, the National Counter Terrorism Center has been doing quite well in terms of 
working closely coordinating other security agencies and trying to see how they focus substantially also on the non-kinetic aspects. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of those uh, engagements where interministerial conversations have happened for how the government can respond to these issues. I think uh, quite a lot is being done, but more actually needs to be done in terms of building this synergy and making sure that there's an interministerial response to, to conflict, violence, and insurgency across the country. I think that harmonization where there's an organic process for how we understand from the perspective of the factors driving these issues to how policy response should happen, I think that's where the missing link is. So we're having all these conversations in different spaces, but how all of these come together into a coherent policy response. Uh, the frameworks are there, the national security policy is there, the national counterterrorism policy is there, you know, the policy frameworks are there, but I think where we can make progress is how we respond to all these issues, even those that are emerging, how we are reading the situation, because these are very volatile situations. We need to continue to monitor, um, not only in form of intelligence, but also to see what policies can actually respond to some of the push and pull factors uh, that we are seeing across different spaces. Um, Barista Elias mentioned communications. That's very key, psychological operations, um, strategic communication. How are we able to change behavior? How are we able to deal with the negative narratives in different contexts? Because there's always a negative narrative driven by violent groups. And to what extent are we providing alternative narrative? Because some of these narratives are actually wrong. They mislead people, misinformation, um, you know, leading to radicalization. What structures do we have on ground to do this effectively and on a regular basis this where is. citizens understand what's going on? Well, Barrister, at the height of um, the insurgency in the Northeast, a lot of calls were made for community policing as a means of, you know, stemming down the effects of uh, the attacks in most parts of that particular region. Uh, to this day, it has still been in the talks. What other measures? Firstly, what is your standpoint on that? And secondly, what other measures do you think can be taken to mitigate um, and completely eradicate the uh, scourge of insurgency in the Northeast? Anyway, first of all, I had already, already said in this uh, program that the state police is a step in the right direction. If there's no other Thing that because of course I have seen the counter arguments against it. Politicians are jacking it and using the instrument of the state to wreak havoc, to cause regionalization and all that. But then we look at the advantage. It's quite outweighs the disadvantage. And if no other thing, the group security, local security consciousness, intelligence gathering, is going to uh, uh, be one of the areas that the state policing uh, would help it, it tremendously. It's going to help. To a very great extent. Of course, we've seen it in other climes where you really have the campus police and the rest of them. It just gives them the necessary training equipment. It's not just like the local security consciousness that we're having everywhere in Nigeria. We have the Amoteco and Bubuagua and all that. You don't know to what extent these people are trained. And all. Of course, you've seen infractions here and there. But if you give these ones, security state police do the right thing, you see it function optimally. That is the thing there. So, Corbyn insurgency, holistically, you know what it is. Of course, we've said it so many times here. You know, the kinetic, non-kinetic means, and all that. Revamp the economy, equip the youths, and all that. You know, and uh, Dr. Paul is actually an authority in this area. So, <laughs> well, 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 we, we might as well get your take on this as well, Dr. Paul, as we close. Yeah, I, I mean, we need to differentiate between the police and policing. They are two different things. And when you talk about vigilantism, it's somewhere in between, uh, which is like a quasi-security uh, outfit that different states, like you mentioned, the Bubuyagu and the Motekum and yeah. uh, the Community Protection Guards, as the case may be. I think that the policy is possibly in Nigeria and uh, community policing at best. Uh, it's the extent to which that relationship between communities and security agencies are established, uh, the extent to which trust is built, there is a perception that Nigerians have about uh, the police and security agencies. We need to deal with that. We need to strengthen that relationship. Yeah. It's not that communities are willing you know, to work with security agencies, but there's the issue of trust. There's the extent to which they also feel that they are protected. 
and also there is the point at which they feel you know uh, that relationship that accountability between the public and security agencies should be strengthened uh, we also need to look at the issues of human rights violation that have happened a couple of times um, so all these factors we need to look at them. It's it's beyond appealing to communities to work with the police or with security agencies. It's about understanding why they are not doing so and strengthening that relationship of accountability so that we can have a very good policing system in Nigeria. And police is everyone's security is everyone's business. So if you see something, if you, you say see something. something, say something. something. But you need to be careful how you say something mm -hmm. because people have said something before and gotten their fingers burnt. <laughs> I must thank you gentlemen as we've come full cycle on this conversation. We do appreciate you for your objective contributions to the discourse.